Father, as we come to this final week, as Advent nearly ends and our waiting, our anticipation almost draws to an end. We still continue to wait for the Christ child. Father, this morning we just pray that you are with us, that you stand amongst us in our time of worship. And just come, Lord Jesus, come in our waiting and be with us now as we head towards Christmas. Amen. Good morning. Nice to see the little bits of you that I can see. I, I want to introduce David, well, actually, the area dean, the <laughs> Reverend David Gerard. So David's fine. David's fine. <laughs> um, David's come and join us this morning because we're going to affirm um, and swear in the church wardens uh, and just to sort of make it official. Um, so that's why David's here. Just a couple of notices. Uh, Christmas Eve, uh, we've got a, a service at 9 o'clock, um, 10 o'clock being midnight in Bethlehem, that's why we have that service, uh, and also we've got a service at 11.30, but numbers are quite low, so um, either online or anybody here, if you would like to come to either of those services, and we please encourage you to come, um, just see Anthea or send Anthea uh, a message and she'll uh, let you know that, uh, what's going to happen. So we gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and God also with, with you. you. We've just come to a short time of confession. Let's just take a moment as we gather our thoughts with God this morning. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes, purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. We confess to you our selfishness and lack of love. Fill us with your spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We confess to you our fear and failure in sharing our faith. Fill us with your spirit. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We confess to you our stubbornness and lack of trust. Fill us with your spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And before the absolution, I just want to offer a short time just to lift to God anything heavy on your hearts this morning that you would like to say sorry for. So, Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is taken from Micah 4, 1-6. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go from Zion, the words of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree. No one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord, our God for ever and ever. In that day declares the Lord, I will gather the lame, I will assemble the exiles, and those I have brought to grief. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Whew, that's better. Please stand for the Gospel reading. 
Alleluia, alleluia, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Alleluia. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him, from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm, and has scattered those who are proud in the innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, and has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful, to Abraham and to his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please do take a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Um, as Andrew said, my name's David. Um, I'm, I am the area dean, but I'm just David. I'm the vicar of... St. Catherine's Bellevue in Wakefield um, and St. Andrew's in Wakefield. And the thing he's really not telling you is that I'm his training incumbent, so I'm his boss. And uh, no, 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 no. He said I thought it was God, but no, it's me. Um, so the main thing I want to tell you lot is that I know you love him, but we want him back afterwards, so just remember... All right, he's not done with us yet. Right, okay. We're going to um, be looking at the Magnificat together. Um, but before I do that, I do want to say, one of the roles I do have as area dean is that I'm supposed to make sure that churches that don't have an incumbent are, um, have people to cover their services while they don't have an incumbent. And what I do want to say publicly to the congregation gathered, I assume online as well, is just a huge thank you to the ministry team here. Because they have done a phenomenal job of making my job easy. Which is always great. They have been so brilliant at making sure that things here are covered. And they've kept this church going during the vacancy. And it's really easy, I think, if you're a regular member of the congregation to not realise how hard that is. But they've done an incredible job of making sure that just keeps going. So I do just want to publicly just state how grateful I am to everyone that's involved in that. So yeah, well done. I always love it when people make my job easy. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to the Magnificat. The Magnificat's... An amazing uh, piece of writing, but if you really want to make sense of it, you need to go right back, because I think this is really, really relevant for today, because let's face it, it's Christmas next week, but we're not quite as full of Christmas cheer as we might be, because you're all spread out and you look like, well, you look like the great train robbers, to be honest with you, what's, what's going on? We're in an unusual situation, aren't we? And yet the Magnificat speaks into it in a way that is really quite profound because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and God looked at all that he had made and he said, ooh, that's good. And then, as we know, things unfortunately went wrong. And Adam and Eve eat the apple and Cain kills Abel and God floods the earth and people build the Tower of Babel. And it just goes on this downward spiral where things go from bad to worse. But then you get to the turning point 
in Scripture, which is Genesis 12. Because in Genesis 12, God calls Abram, or better known as Abraham, because that's what his name's changed to later on. God calls Abraham and he promises him, look, leave your country, leave your father's household and go to the place where I will send you and I will turn you into a great nation and I will make your name great and all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. And this is key. It means that God calls Abraham and says, right, through you, I'm going to fix everything else. So come and do what I call you. Become a new people. And it's that promise, it's that hope that drives the entire Old Testament into the day of Jesus. This belief that they are the called people. They are the people through whom God is going to fix the world. They are God's chosen. And all the way through, wherever you pick it, in the Old Testament, you will see this hope is driving what's going on. Whether it's will they get to the land that God promised Abraham. Will they be faithful in the way that allows these promises to come true? Because they regularly prove quite unfaithful. And as it goes on, the faith that the hope does change slightly because they realize that the descendants of Abraham, well, they're just as messed up and flawed as everybody else, as you and me and all the other ones of us that make mistakes all the time. And so there's this promise that one day this, this king will come, this, this descendant of David. And when he comes, the promises made to Abraham will finally be fulfilled. And the hope will come true at last. The world will be put true at last. And that's nicely summed up in our Old Testament reading that we had in Micah 4. Micah says, all the nations will come to know God and they will stream to the temple. In other words, they'll all come to God. They'll know God themselves and they'll learn to live with God's priorities. And they will settle all their disputes, not with war, because their saws will be turned into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. You know, their their bombs will be turned into tractors. Their nuclear war, nuclear warheads will be turned into flower pots. It's that kind of image. There'll be no more war, and everyone will have enough. That's that whole bit where it says everyone will sit under their own vine and have their own fig tree. In other words, everyone will have shelter and food. They'll have enough to live on. Everyone will have a roof over their heads. Everyone will live in safety and security. People won't be afraid anymore. And it's that hope that this new king embodies that one day everything will be right, that the king will come and there will be justice and kindness and they will walk humbly with their God. And it's that hope, it's that belief that the people of Jesus' time lived in. But here's also the thing. It felt as though that hope was falling apart. It felt as if that hope was so far from coming true. Because they lived under Caesar, they lived under the Roman Empire, and if you dared to revolt, if you dared to complain, then they would sweep in like you wouldn't believe and kill everyone. Um, A couple of uh, miles from Nazareth, about four miles away, there was a city called Sephorus, They dared to revolt in Sephorus. This would have been when Jesus was about eight-ish. They dared to revolt and the Romans stormed in and crucified 3,000 people at once. A contemporary historian, Josephus, says that you could hear the screaming from 30 miles away. Jesus was four. Some historians suggest that maybe that's where Joseph went. He died in this uprising. Maybe. Maybe. We don't know. But that's the world he was living in. And more than that, they suffered 
unbelievably with taxes. The historians reckon that they were paying in the region of 80 to 90% tax. People were losing their family lands. I want you to picture again how shocking this would be. For generations, your family has kept this piece of land. And now you're having to sell it for the first time. This is the land God gave your ancestors when you came into the land. Do you see how your hope is attached to this land? And now you're having to sell it just to feed Your family, maybe 50 generations of people, and it all comes to an end with you. They lived in a world where the richest 1% were getting richer and richer and richer, while the other 99% were getting poorer and poorer and poorer. Can you imagine living in such a world? This was the world that they lived in, and this is the historical background to the Christmas story that we have turned into some cute little fairy tale but it's not this was a people living under tyranny and in desperation this were a people that were calling out God if you are our God then how come Herod is on the throne if you are our God how come Caesar's on the throne if you're our God how come I'm having to sell off my family lands if you're God if you're good how come I can't feed my family God if you're God why can't I see my family at Christmas God if you're good how come cancer how come coronavirus how come climate change How come black lives matter? How come sexual abuse in the church? God, if you're so good, how come? This is the question that's in the air. Which does finally bring me to the Magnificat. I haven't forgotten that I'm preaching on that, by the way. You get to Luke 1, and I do want you to notice it. Because it is amazing. You've got here a teenage girl. In all the films, by the way, she's like, what, in her 20s or something. She wasn't. She would have been about 13. You've got this poor teenage girl whose life is at risk. And she bursts into this amazing song. And it's full, by the way, of, do you know I was talking about Micah? Do you know I was talking about all these promises that are throughout the Old Testament that are promising that one day this king will come, it's stuffed full of them. For starters, it's a cover version of Hannah's song in the Old Testament, but she throws in some more. She's throwing in quotes from the Psalms and from Samuel and from Zechariah and all these places. She's just stuffing them all in there. And it's basically a way of saying, these promises are finally, sorry, I get enthusiastic, these promises are finally coming true. But more than that, notice what she actually says. Here she is, a a member of an oppressed ethnic minority, and she dares to stand up and say the rich will be cast down. The poor shall be thread. I mean, it's unbelievable when you actually read it. She's turning around and saying Caesar and Herod and their cronies have had their day. The hungry are going to be fed. The desperate and those who are having to sell their lands, they're going to be taken care of. For her, this is not some sort of detached saviour that floats above on clouds somewhere. This is a real concrete salvation. Which in human history, God is coming and he's going to change the world. This is about the transformation of this World. This is, to use the line from Old Little Town of Bethlehem, this is a declaration that all the hopes and fears of all the years are met in this Jesus tonight. This is the declaration. I mean, if you don't read it and kind of think, you go girl, at the end, you haven't read it properly. This is an unbelievable revolutionary song. This is what one scholar puts it. This is Thomas Cahill. He writes it like this. This is a a larger than life song of triumph. Thanking God for righting all wrongs by making a definitive choice 
in favour of the powerless over the powerful. No one knows it yet, but the poor, the hungry and the humiliated have won. And this unknown 14-year-old is their unexpected representative. Come on, how good's that? She stands up and says, God is finally doing what he said he always would. This is the kingdom that we celebrate coming as God becomes one of us. The powers of the Roman Empire have crumbled into dust. And we're still here. It's a loud declaration. Christmas is a loud declaration that God has not given up on this world. That plagues and pandemics and wars and famines and injustice and racism, they cannot last because Jesus has been born. So I want you to do me a favour. When you go home and you look at the news and you think, oh man, this is bad, isn't it? When you feel like despairing, I want you to remember that Caesar is nothing but a statue in a museum now. But we're still here because darkness can never put out the light. Let's pray. Lord God, we acknowledge that we live in dark times. We acknowledge that sometimes we are tempted to give in to despair. We are tempted to question where you are and what's going on. But Lord, in those moments, we pray that you would help us to remember that coronavirus and death and cancer and divorce and depression, none of these things have the last word. Because you have the last word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, that's the kingdom that has been launched and all of us are called to be part of it. And two of them have been called to a particular job within that. And that's our church wardens. So I'm going to ask them to stand. Kevin and Peter, please do stand up for me. There you go. So, church wardens are called to represent the people of God, to work with the leadership of the parish, ordained and lay, to be an example and encouragement to their fellow Christians and the wider community, and to promote unity and peace. As you come to be admitted to the office of church warden, I ask you to affirm your commitment to this calling and to seek God's grace and the power of his Holy Spirit to fulfil it. Will you, as church wardens, seek to work with the bishop, your incumbent, the parochial church council, and all those who exercise leadership responsibility in your church to further the mission of God and his purposes in the world? Will you undertake your task as a spiritual and holy calling 
and seek in word and action to promote unity and peace. Will you care for the fabric and property of the church as stewards of God and make it your responsibility to ensure its proper upkeep and repair? May God be your helper and give you grace to serve him with joy, with humility and with strength. And may your ministry as church warden witness to the gospel of Christ and serve the building of his kingdom and his church now and always. Amen. I'm going to make our declaration, so please repeat after me. I solemnly and sincerely declare before God and his people that I will faithfully and diligently discharge the duties of the office of church warden for the parish for which I have been chosen during the period of my appointment. So I now duly and canonically admit you as church wardens of the parish in which you serve. As God has called you to this ministry, so he will not fail you. Can I ask you all please to stand? Just before I ask this, have you all got the answer in front of you? Yeah? Good. Okay, so you know what you're saying. That's good. So brothers and sisters... Will you work with your church wardens to strengthen the body of Christ and to promote the mission of the church in your parish? With the help of God, we will. Amen. Please do sit down. Thank you, both. Go on, you can give them a round of applause. It's all right. They'll need it. We come to our affirmation of faith. So having just told you all to sit down, please stand up again. So let us declare our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please do take a seat for our intercessions. To the bidding, Lord, in your mercy, would you please respond with, hear our prayer. Dear Lord and Father, we come before you at this time as a family here at Holy Trinity Church and ask that you will accept these prayers which are offered in humility and sincerity through our mediator, your son, who died on the cross that we may have hope of life eternal. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of your presence when we are gathered in your name. Help us to be mindful that you are with us as we meet to pray and bring our requests to you. Loving God, as we approach the day of Christ's birth, help us to throw wide the doors of our hearts in preparation. Help us to acknowledge the importance of what happened so long ago. Help us to understand the words of the angels and the prophets and the teachers of old and to celebrate all the promises that you made through them. Help us to know that even now you are seeking to work in us and through us to fulfill the promises you have made. Make us receptive to being your messengers and guide us to proclaim your message of salvation 
to all those we come into contact with in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In our uncertain world, we bring before you today our concerns. We look with sorrow on the condition of the world with so much evidence of cruelty and greed. Have mercy on our world and all humankind. We pray for the leaders of all countries that they would gain vision to understand the important issues of our time. We think especially of the coronavirus pandemic which has destroyed so many lives and ask that you guide those who make decisions. May they have the courage to uphold what is just and right. Lord, in your mercy, hear our hear prayer. Our we pray for the church throughout the world, the great family of which we are a part. Give strength and wisdom to church leaders that they may seek your will in all situations. Show us as individuals in this church how to support and care for each other in any way we can. Teach us to be slow to anger. Teach us patience with each other. Teach us to love one another. Teach us to pull together as a united team with Christ as our leader. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for those in need around us. Wrap your arms around them and give them comfort. We pray for our families and friends that you will be to them all that they most deeply need. We bring before you those whose lives are darkened by pain, fear or weariness. We remember the elderly, the housebound and those in isolation through COVID restrictions and the lonely. In a moment of silence, let us each individually pray for those known to ourselves. Help us all to bear what must be carried and take from us all bitterness and resentment, replacing it with your peace. In these anxious times, let us not forget the many blessings you still bestow on us and give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our hear prayer. Our Lord, may this Christmas season be for us and for those around us a season of healing. May it be a season of hope and love and joy. May it be a time of true sharing and rejoicing. Let us take time away from the hustle and bustle of Christmas shopping and planning and reflect on the true meaning of Christmas. Without Christ's birth, we would not have hope of life eternal. Let us all give prayerful thanks for God's love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our hear prayer. prayer. Father God, you sent your Son into the world to be the Saviour of all who believe. You promised that he will come again to be our judge. At this Advent time, increase in us the attitude of watchfulness and prayer, that we might always be ready to meet him. May our lives be active in service to you, and a witness to your living presence in our lives. Guide our steps by the light of your love. Let not the darkness overtake us. Let your light shine on us, Father. Let your love shine in us for all to see. Let the light of the Spirit shine through us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers. For the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We stand for the peace. In the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high shall break upon us to give light to those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please sit down.
Look upon us in mercy, not in judgment. Draw us from hatred to love. Make the frailty of our praise a dwelling place for your glory. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. And now we give you thanks because in his coming, the day of our deliverance has dawned and through him you will make all things new as he comes in power and triumph to judge the world. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Saviour of the world. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people, and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death 
until he comes. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Thank you. 
we pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. May God himself, the God of peace, make you perfect and holy and keep you safe and blameless in spirit, soul and body for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. As we await our coming Saviour, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.